All right, let's get started tonight. Uh, if you're able, let's stay in hymn number 395. 395. In my heart there rings a melody. 395. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody of love. On that last will be my endless theme in glory with the angels i will sing Twill be a song with glorious harmony when the courts of heaven ring in my heart there rings a melody there rings a melody with heaven's harmony in my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Turn over to 390, 390 is every promise in the book is mine. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. All the blessings of his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. Let's sing it one more time. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. All the blessings of his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. Brother Galen, would you come up here and open us in prayer? Lord, thank you for this day. I pray that you give us all a good day, dear Lord. And I pray that you give Brother Tucker the words you have him to say. And I pray that you would um, give us all a good night. And uh, thank you for letting us come to your house and worship you, dear Lord. In the name of Friday, amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Remember our announcements from this morning. Anniversary Sunday is February 26th. No, I'm sorry, February 6th. February 6th, and that's 10, 10 o'clock. One big service there, first Sunday in February, okay? It's not the 26th, it's the first Sunday in February, February 6th. And then uh, our, our revival is the next week, revival February 13th through 16th with Brother Paul Swanky. And um, y'all know him, he's very good. He knows how to expound the scriptures and just uh, one of my favorite guys. Um, <clears throat> tell you, remind you about Brother Clifton Barker, his... He has a surgery procedure done on February 2nd. So y'all pray for him on that. And uh, that procedure is supposed to give him instant relief. So, um, yep, and uh, February 2nd. So that's coming up in a couple weeks. And I ran into them at Walmart, and I was getting stuff for to make me a banana pudding. Okay? And I had enough, made them some, and I made Dad some too that's in the refrigerator. Uh, just trying out a different recipe. Just, I don't. I love banana pudding, so I'm just trying to figure out how I like it. I like it hot. Okay, I like my Peggy's, uh, and I'm just. I don't. I don't like the way I made it today, but it's still edible. Okay, but anyway, um, let's see. Uh, it doesn't. Doesn't. It's just. I'm up here, so. I get to chase some rabbits. <laughs> if you want some, you can stop by the house. And I did not. No, not not a share. And Finley, Finley got into it, and Liam got into it, and I got into it. Okay, that's the way it goes. Yeah, uh, um, I liked it. I made it a little with, uh, with cream cheese this time, just to try it out. It's it's pretty good. Huh. Anyway, and then uh, my wife tells me that. Uh, uh, I need to s stay off TikTok 
for recipes. And uh, that's because that's, that's where I get it. I get, you know, I saw some how they made some biscuits. And I almost picked up a little tub of lard just to, just to make some biscuits in the morning. Uh, just, uh, it, I'm hungry. That's probably where I'm at right now, hungry. Um, remember, um, pray for Brother Jake down there in uh, Lafayette. I know he got a blessing with 30000 raised for for the church there in Lafayette and some dental work and his school, kids schooling. So uh, blessing there and uh, pray for Brother Burton. They're supposed to come in for our anniversary Sunday, anniversary February 6th. Uh, so they'll be in. I think Brother Aaron's supposed to be in. So we have some, some guys coming in. We have a good crew coming in. So y'all be in your place for, for that. Um, they're all out of our church doing a wonderful work for the Lord. And God's really blessing them and using them. Um, Reverend, pray for Preacher and Miss Deanna, and uh, Preacher's sick. Uh, Miss Deanna's, I guess, trying to take care of him. I don't know. Well, Josh don't know. He said, I don't go downstairs. I stay away from him. So um, y'all pray for pray for them. Pray for Miss Deanna, uh, Preacher. I don't know who to pray for more. Uh, that's a, probably Miss Deanna. All right, so we'll go with that one. Uh, pray for Brother Todd Painter, missionary to Thailand. He's got some health issues, and uh, pray those can get sor- sorted out so he can get back on the field. And then, um, any anybody else with prayer requests tonight? I know it's kind of different, but yes, sir. All right. Did you say Art Scott? All right. All right. Art Scott's wife has cancer and moved to her brain. Yes, Carly. Oh, yeah, coming up. Uh, the volleyball basketball tournament's coming up this week, next week, whenever. Um, and you know what Carly's thinking. She's all about playing. It's her mindset every day. Dad, let's go practice volleyball yes I'll throw a ball at you that's what that's pretty much what happens uh, any anybody else anybody else had a prayer request on the all right well we're gonna keep moving let's sing uh, sh- this world is not my home 485 485 y'all can stay seated on that 485 Let me get to it first, Crystal. All right, here we go, 485. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Let's sing the third. I have a loving Savior up in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I with his sand. He's waiting now for me in heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The 
saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Let's turn to 491. 491. Let's stand on this one. 491. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes of fright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. On that last hole. Rock divine, O oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land shelter in the time of storm one more we'll go to go over to 500 hymn number 500 and uh, remember the offering plates are in the back so when you go out the building go out the door there offerings on your left also there will be a love offering basket for brother tucker so if i forget it's out there just to remind y'all okay because i forget a lot of times hymn number 500 Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. On that second, let me at a throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, help my unbelief. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Oh, that third. Trusting only in thy merit, would I seek thy face? Heal my wounded, broken spirit, save me by thy grace. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Thou the 
spring of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. You may be seated. All right, Brother Tucker, it's yours. Amen. If you have your Bibles open to the book of Psalms, let me see if I can get this going. Is that on? Is that on? Okay. Uh, Brother J.D. called me this morning and asked me if I could preach tonight. I told him I could. And may I say first thing, I'm all in, brother. I'm all in. But, uh, I got to thinking about what could I preach, you know. I said, "Well, I've got this this uh, sermon about soul winning, growing graceful gospelizers was what I titled it. You know, use a little bit of of a literary license with the word there, but you know, it talks about some of the things we need. You know, salvation and and supplication and saturation in the word and and uh, Things like that, and I said, I got to think, no, I preached that one here a while back here, so let me try something else. And I had a song on revival, and it was talking about a great revival, and I talked about, you know, there's different ingredients. There was great power and great praise and great boldness and, and great preaching and, and uh, some things in there, and I thought about it and said, no, I preached that one here a while back. So I got to thinking, finally I just gave up. I said, well, it doesn't matter just about everything that I've ever preached, I've preached here. So y'all may get something that you've heard before, but hopefully it's been far enough back that you won't remember it. And I just say, uh, y'all keep praying for me. I had a good time up in Mountain View, Arkansas this week, and we had some real good services. The altars were full ever ever service, and we knocked doors and put out a lot of tracks, but didn't see anybody saved, and uh, Wednesday afternoon, I was knocking doors up there, and I, this woman came to the door, and I tried to give her a track, and she said, no, I'm not going to take y'all's, because y'all won't listen to what I've got to say. I'm not going to give y'all uh, any attention either, and I said, well, what are you trying to teach? She said what she was trying to teach. She said, oh, I'm wicked. I said, okay. Boy, I got out of there as fast as I could get, you know. But uh, you never know what you're going to run into when you're out there knocking doors. And I guess that makes the exciting part, but it sure is good when you run across somebody that that the Lord's prepared to heart and they want to get saved, amen. And Miss Peggy, I do like your uh, banana pudding too, amen. I know that was... One of James's favorite desserts was that banana pudding. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Psalms chapter 90. Psalms chapter 90. And I will try tonight not to be too long, and I don't see the clock either, but, but uh, I'm like Brother Lee. I'm kind of hungry tonight, so I don't think I'll preach too long. Yeah, amen. Psalms chapter 90. We're going to read verse 8 and 9 of Psalms chapter 90. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, I just want to thank you for the privilege we have to be in your house and I ask you Lord just to bless this time together in your word and we we'll give you all glory in Jesus name I pray amen our text verse for the message tonight is taken out of the last part of verse 9 where it says 
For all our days are passed away in thy wrath, for we spend our year, years, <clears throat> for we spend our years as a tale that is told. And I'm going to ask the question tonight. What tale are you telling? What tale are you telling? I could say, what tale will be told about your telling, but you know you could arrange it a whole lot of ways, but what are you telling? What tale are you telling? You know, it says there, it talks about the Lord knows our iniquities. He knows our secret sins. There is nothing that the Lord does do. Not anything, not not even anything we can think about that the Lord doesn't know. And you can't hide from that. You know, some people think they're hiding from, from, you know, each other, you know, and all these different things, but you can't hide from the Lord. The Lord knows. The Bible says that the Word of God is sharp and powerful and uh, like a two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder between soul and spirit and knows even the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So God doesn't even, I mean, God knows everything we know, but he even knows the intent. He knows what our intent is, what our motives are. You know, one time, that's one of the things that I say, Brother Scott Seifert's one of the things that I remember him preaching, and he talked about that, he prayed for pure motives. And you know, I said, man, that's something good to pray for. Because if we're not careful, we're wrapped up in flesh and blood, aren't we? And if we're not careful, we'll be doing our own thing. And we'll be going our own way, and the Lord will have to reach down and slap us and get our attention to get us back on track. And you know, I would rather make the adjustments myself than have to take a spanking from the Lord. May I say, I've taken a few spankings in my time. I've taken a lot more than I want to admit. And what tale are you telling? You know, when it comes to, if the Lord doesn't come back, and I always say that I'm going to be taken by the upper taker, not the undertaker, amen. But if the Lord doesn't come back, one day they're going to place that casket up there and the preacher's going to say some words over the casket and people's going to come by and look. And, you know, what's the usual thing they say? Oh, he looks natural. Well, he's dead, you know. He's going to look natural. That's, uh, that's the only thing you can say, you know. But there's going to be some people that remember your life. And they're going to remember what you did. And may I say, uh, what's the preacher say? The lie will go five miles while the truth is putting his shoes on. And if you do something bad, May I say that the devil points that out to everybody. And, you know, the Bible talks about that we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It talks about uh, Hebrews 9, 27. said, is it appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment? We're going to stand before Christ. And the Bible talks about we are given account for every idle word. Every idle word. That means something we said without thinking about it. Have you ever opened your mouth and put your foot in? Boy, I've done that a lot. And, you know, when Miss Alice was alive, a lot of times she was tell me after, said, do you know how that sounded? And I said, well, no. She'd go on, and I'd say, well, I didn't mean it that way. And, you know, Miss Alice would say, I know you didn't mean it that way. She said, but I know you. And they don't. And they might read it some other way. And I think about it. Yeah, it did sound pretty bad, didn't it? I've said some dumb things over the years. But our life 
is going to tell a tale. And it says we live our life as a tale that is told. And when we get to the end of our day, somebody's going to say something, but may I say that while we're alive, we're telling the story right now. And, you know, we can make adjustments right now. You know, we can't do anything with what's past. I heard Curtis Hudson one time talking about uh, he took a sheet of paper, and I heard this, so I just visualized it in my mind. He said, make a, lar a line, a mark on the sheet of paper, and put a mark right there, and put a mark right there. He said, now, that's your life. Now put a mark where you think you are. You know, and you put a mark there. Okay, all this that's on the left, you can't do anything about it. All that's on the right, that's something that hadn't been done yet, so you can make adjustments on that part. You live your life as a tale that is told. So what is your life telling? What does everybody know about you? You know, there's some, some things you know about people, you know, Brother Joe, he's known as the big hunter and fisherman. And uh, I like to fish. Most people know that. You know, it doesn't take very long to people find out what you like. Unfortunately, I'm a Razorback fan. Most people know that. But what is your life telling? What really matters, though, that you're telling people about yourself? And I just thought about this. This was the first verse that came to my mind after I kind of thought about those sermons and, and uh, decided that I wasn't going to preach anything that y'all hadn't heard before. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. Wasn't going to preach anything that y'all probably hadn't heard from me. And I'm going to ask you to pray for me because uh, I've got some meetings coming up and and pray this next week. I've got three different pastors that promised me a meeting and they're going to call me and give me the dates next week. So y'all pray about that. But you know our life's telling that story. Telling the story. What's your life telling? What's the tale that's going to be told? May I say, one of the things I want to be said about my life is that I love God. Amen. 1 Corinthians 8, 3 says, If any man love God, the same is known of him. And you know, people, I heard there was a man one time that uh, taught Sunday school in a little country church that I was in. The Lord kind of laid it on his heart. He was in the big church out at White. He had a farm out there somewhere around White. And he came, Brother Garfield Goodwin was his name. I mean, a fine Bible teacher. And really preached when he taught Sunday school. And, you know, I heard somebody say one time, well, you don't talk very long to Brother Garfield if he doesn't find out about your salvation. Amen. Hey, the people know that you love God? You know, I've had... People before tell me, you know, be trying to get some plumbing work lined out, and they say, well, we can do it this day, and then they say, they would make the statement, oh, wait a minute, that's on church day. You don't do it that late in the evening. You know, people that got off late of work said, that might tie you up for church and have to plan another day. Hey, I want it said about my life. When I, I want it said about me now, but when I die, I really want it said about me that Brother Tucker loved God. Hey, I want it known everywhere. I want to shout it uh, loud and clear and far and near that I love God. You know, I listen to YouTube sometimes. Uh, West Coast Baptist College had a video on it and uh, an ensemble there. There was about six or eight girls and about six or eight guys that were singing and then this girl was singing. And she said, the only thing I want in life is to be known for loving Christ, to build His church and love His bride, to make His name known far and wide. I thought, man, that's good.
You know, can it be said about you? Hey, Brother Tucker loved God. Or are they going to come to that point and say, man, that was a mean old dog. What tale are you, what tale is your life telling right now? What will be the tale that's told? May I say we're writing the chapters right now. Writing the chapters right now. What tale will be told? And I want it said about me, first and foremost, that I love God. Number two, I want it said that I love my family and my church and my church family and my pastor. Amen? Amen. You know the Bible says that in Psalms 133.1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Second John 5, let me look over here. I forgot what that says off the top of my head. Second John 5 says, Oh, said, but I wrote a new commandment unto thee that but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. 1 Timothy 5, 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. And it's in my Bible there. Right before 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy 5, 17. It says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the Word and doctrine. Hey, I want it said I love my church. Amen. Do you love your church? Do you love your pastor? Amen. I think I'm in the greatest church in the world. I think I have the greatest pastor in the world. And it said, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Hey, may I say, we ought to be thankful that we don't have a lot of those Dr. So-and-sos for our pastor. Because a lot of those guys, they may have a bunch of degrees, more degrees than a thermometer, and they sit in their office, and they never do anything to try to help anybody. I know uh, one church, big church in town, and a friend of mine, he does air conditioning work, and he was working for, uh, uh, I can't think, Comfort heating and air at that time and he made an appointment with this pastor because somebody that he was working with their family were members of this church and this guy the Lord was dealing about salvation about salvation with him and he came to this pastor and told him hey man he's he's asking questions he's getting ready I believe if you just call him in you could lead him to the Lord right now and the pastor of this big church said, I do my evangelism from the pulpit. And my friend said he never had anything good to think about that man after that. In other words, somebody was ready to get saved, but you were too lazy to, to make an appointment with them and lead them to the Lord. Now, I don't know what you thought you was doing, but hey, we got a great pastor. Amen. Hey, we got a great church. Hey, it's not perfect. I'm a member of it, so that makes it not perfect, doesn't it? But you know, that's the thing. If somebody said they really loved the ministry, it was just the people that gave them problems, you know. Well, you know, that's what the ministry is about. It's about people, and we all have our own preferences and our own ideas, and we all... Sometimes we kind of push each other the wrong way and do things, but the bottom line, hey, we got a church where we can serve God. The Bible is being preached. Preached. The Bible is being preached. I can say the words. I promise I can. The Bible is being preached in spirit and in truth with power. <laughs> May I say there's a lot of churches that that's not the story. There's a lot of churches that's 
as the preacher said at his driest, last year's bird's nest, and it's empty too. So if you got a good church, you better be thankful for it. And when I get to that point, I want it said about my life, hey, I love my church and I love my pastor. Amen. And you know, if we love God, we're going to love people. Amen. And we're going to love each other. And we're going to love our church. Hey, what do we call the group of believers? A church family. Amen. And that's what we are. We're a family. And you know we ought to act like that. We ought to love one another. And I want it said about my life that I love God and I love my church. And I also want it said about my life that I love this book. Yes, amen. amen. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Yes. I want it known about my life that I had a love for this book. Amen. Hey, I love this book. And I love to preach this book. Amen. And you know what? I was getting, when I first started preaching and everything, and and through the youth fellowship, Joe Tarr and I, I became pretty good friends, you know. And I was asking him to pray about it. I was getting to preach somewhere. And I said, pray that I'll have the right message, you know. He said, you got a King James Bible. You're going to have the right message. I said, that's all that makes the difference. So you have the right message. And I never had really thought about it, you know, but hey, we got plenty of preaching material and we don't ever exhaust that material. Hey, I want it said that I love this book. You know, if you turn your Bibles over there to 2 Timothy chapter 4, I want you to see what Paul wrote to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he said, I charge thee, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of, the, of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Paul told Timothy, Preach the word. And you know, like I said, the, he said the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Hey, we're living in those days right now. You know, the, a lot of these churches, you see them, they've got them full, and they want somebody to come up and talk about some kind of psychology for 30 minutes. And a friend of mine made the statement that he listened to one of those TV evangelists on purpose, one time, two different sermons for 30 minutes just to see how it was. He said in two 30-minute sermons, the only time you ever heard the name of Jesus was when you prayed at the end. He said somebody evidently taught him how to pray in the name of Jesus. And that's the only time he ever mentioned. There was 16, 18,000 there, both services, and never said the word of Jesus. What's it talk about? Human reasoning? That we should not uh, be turned into fables? And that we shouldn't listen to those uh, endless genealogies and things that minister questions? Hey, we got the truth. We don't have to deviate, deviate from the truth. 
We just need to stay on the right path and just keep preaching. Amen. So I want it said about my life that I love this book. Hey, I don't know how much time I've got left, but the time that I have left, I want to preach this Word, and I want God to use me greater than He ever has. Amen. And y'all just keep praying for me that the Lord will open doors and the Lord is opening doors and I thank God for that. But I want it said that I love God and that I love my church and I love my pastor and I love this book. And I want it said about me that I love souls. When I get to the end of my life, nobody could give me a greater compliment and say, Brother Tucker was a soul. I remember one time we had a lady in the church. I led her to the Lord. And I told Alice when I led her to the Lord, I said, unless the Lord changes her heart, we'll never keep her because she's right about every church she's ever been in. Y'all hear me? And sure enough, oh, they were all excited for a while. And then Grandma got sick, and they started missing, you know, because Grandma was sick. And then hunting season started, or hunting season, if you're from up north. And so they were missing even more. And my daughter, Kim, and one of the ladies went out to visit her, and she was all upset. We had had a revival Brother Ben Nichols preached for us. And there was this lady who came and her grandson came with her and another young boy and the lady was, the the grandson was about 13, the boy's about 13, big old tall boys, you know. And one of them went back to get a drink of water and he was just standing around there looking at the picture. And Brother Nichols said, hey preacher, go get the kid and tell him to come in here where he can listen to the preaching. He's just looking at the picture. So I went back and said, come on, man, let's go up here and sit down. After the service, that young man got saved. Amen. But that lady got all upset because that preacher called that kid down during the service. She didn't say anything about the boy getting saved. I said, but the boy got saved. Oh, she wouldn't focus on that. She focused on the fact that the preacher said something about it. Hey, haven't we all been taught to act right in church? And I know sometimes when we're kids, sometimes we don't quite make it. I know I didn't go to church very much, but my cousin went to this uh, pilgrim rest at the time, and sometimes I'd go with him my mother didn't really like me going because he was such a bad driver. And she was afraid, you know. She'd see him on the wrong side of the roads and different things. So she was really afraid of letting me go with him. But I went a few times, and she told me before I left, I said, you sit on that front row, and you be quiet, and you behave while that preacher's preaching. I said, have you cut up? said, all your aunts and uncles down there, I'll know it before you get halfway back house. I'll know what you've done. And then you're going to have trouble. You know what I did when I came to church? When it was time for preaching, I sit there like this. And I looked at the preacher. Now some of my cousins right there would be talking back and forth between me, and I was thinking, oh no, they're going to say something about it, and I'm going to get in trouble. But what are you saying, Brother Bobby? This lady also made the statement there and now. She was complaining about the preaching, which she hadn't heard in a while. Said there wasn't nothing being preached there. Said all y'all are about is soul winning. And I didn't think about it at the time. I'd preached through the book of James, the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians. The book of Colossians, you know, going through the Bible on Wednesday night. But, of course, they wasn't there on Wednesday night. 
But later on, I got to thinking about it. She was trying to run me down, but that's the greatest compliment she could give me was that I was a, the church was all about soul winning. Well, am I wrong? Have I got a mixed up idea? But isn't that what the church is supposed to be about? Is seeing people say. But I want it said about me that I'm a soul winner. You know, the Bible says, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, every person needs a preacher. Every creature needs a preacher. And there's somebody that I can reach and somebody that you can reach that nobody else can reach. Because you have a way with them and they listen to you, but they might not listen to uh, a preacher. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I want it said about my life that I love my that I love God, that I love my church, and I love my pastor, that I love the book, and that I love soul winning. May I say, what's the Bible say about he that converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin? You know, that verse is true. I ought to be busy all the time because i got a multitude of sins I need hid. Amen. So when? We ought to be busy about it. And then somebody comes to the end of my life and they're at my casket and they're talking about me. I want it said that I was a man of prayer. Amen. Hey, what's the Bible tell us? First Thessalonians five seventeen, pray without ceasing. You know, when I first surrendered to preach, and I heard all these guys talking, and they were getting all these books, and they were telling me how to preach and how to pray and all this stuff. And I was reading this book, Doctor House. You know, he said that he uh, down there in Texas he prayed. At least 10 hours a week, he went soul winning at least 10 hours a week, and he read his Bible at least 10 hours a week. So one day I got the bad I, the idea, I, I'm going to see how long that I actually pray, you know. And I had my list, and I went through, and I prayed my heart out. And I looked up, 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes. Well, you know, everybody's not a marathon runner. And everybody's not a marathon prayer. But we can all pray some. And you know, if you get the Lord on the line and keep that attitude of prayer, you know, during your day you think of something. You know, so just lift your name up to the Lord. Hey, Lord, help so-and-so. They're, they're going through a hard time right now. Amen. I want it said about me that I'm a man of prayer. And... You know, people call and want me to pray for things, and I pray, but, you know, the Bible said, not the Bible, but John R. Rice was famous for making the statement, all our failures are prayer failures. Now, I've failed so much, so I must have failed to pray enough. And that's sad. But I can't do anything about yesterday. I can do something about tomorrow. I can start tomorrow on my knees before God, and I can start praying. So I want it said, what is your life telling? What's the tale that's going to be told when you're gone? When you stand before God and God says, is He going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Or are you going to be red-faced and ashamed? I know it's with fear and trembling that I think about the judgment seat of Christ. But I want it said that I love God, that I love my church, and I love my pastor, and I love this book, and I love soul winning, and I want to be a man of prayer, and I also want to be a man that's looking for a second coming. Amen. I preach about the second coming a lot when I preach. But you know... If we could just get a hold of that ministry, that message, just get a hold of that thought. 
hey, the Lord's coming back. I don't know the hour or the day. I'm not going to set a date. You know, all these nuts, they always set the date and give that reasons. I know back in the 80s, in 87, I think it was, they came out with a book, The 87 Reasons Why the Rapture's Going to Occur in 87. Every preacher I knew had a copy of that book, you know. They wanted to see what the guy was saying, you know. But I want to look for his appearing. He's coming. If I could just get that in my everyday thought. Lord, what will you have me do today? Because you may come back. If I took that as something that guided my day, would it make a difference in what I did? Or would I just go along just skipping along, thinking about my own stuff, not worried about anybody else? I want it said that I love His appearing. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, Paul says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. That love His appearing. Hey, there's a crown that we can win to lay down at Jesus' feet if we're looking for that second coming. You know, the Bible says, in an hour you think, uh, in an hour you think not, the Lord's coming. Do you really believe He's coming today? Do you really believe He's coming tomorrow? You know, they say, well, He could, but we really don't live like we think He's coming. And I'm not saying. You know, quit everything you're doing and go up on a mountaintop like some of those nuts did years ago, you know, and and just be busy about the Lord's business and be thinking about the Lord could come back today. And I always loved what the preacher said about LaDonna Collin. And he preached on the second coming one day. He saw LaDonna. She was out there looking out the window. He said, LaDonna, what you doing? She said, well, I was looking to see if the Lord was coming. He said, he could come back today. I'm just checking. And everybody that knows LaDonna Collins knows LaDonna was a special young lady. But you know, that ought to be all of us this afternoon. Hey, I'm looking for him coming. So I want it said, most of all, that I love God that I love my church and my pastor, that I love this book, that I love soul winning, that I was a man of prayer, that I was looking for His appearing. But I also want it said that I finished well. Apostle Paul said there in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Well, wouldn't that be an awesome comment? Somebody says he fought a good fight. He finished his course. He's kept the faith. And I know I fall so short every day. And I should probably abuse somebody else as an example. But I want it said that I love God. I want to finish well. Second John, verse 8 says, let me get that where I don't misquote it. Second John, verse 8. First John, second John. Let's see, I'm right in here on top of it. Second John, verse 8 says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. That we receive a full reward. So the Apostle John's implying that hey, we can lose some of the treasure that we've laid up in heaven if we just get slack and we just say, Lord, I'm not worrying about you anymore. I heard it one time I heard a preacher say that, you know, he's teaching that, you know, we're going to have to give an account to God 
and that we're responsible for the Word of God, for what we're taught, that we're responsible. You know, the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. And so the guy asked him, you mean what you teach? That I'm going to be responsible for how I, my application, how I uh, do with the Word? He said, yeah. He said, you're going to be responsible with how you respond to the preaching of the Word. He said, well, I don't want to worry about that. He just took the Bible over out of his way and walked out. You know, that's a poor attitude. And he said that's only happened once. And this was a preacher that pastored thousands of people. You know, I messed up a lot. And there's a lot of times I've kind of sputtered. And I haven't been all that I should have been. And I could have done a lot more. But I'm just putting that under the breath. Amen. And I'm just going to try to do better about tomorrow. What tale is being told? What tale are you telling with your life? Would y'all prove it? Please stand. What time is it, Miss Lydia? Six fifty-seven. I got through in time. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, dear Lord. As the altars are open, I just want to give you all the glory for everything good that you do for your salvation. And Lord, I want to do better with what you've entrusted in me. And I want the tale that's told about my life to improve from this point on. I just want to ask Christians, Christians, maybe you haven't been hitting on all cylinders, but you want to do better, would you raise your hand just as a testimony of God's goodness? Isn't it good that we can come to you, Lord, and just lay it all at your feet and you can bless us from that point on? And I want to ask, is there somebody under the sound of my voice who's not sure they're going to heaven? I don't want to just assume that we're all saved. Is there anybody like that so I could pray for them? I will pray pray for them. Is there anybody like that? Okay. I'm going to ask Christians what tale is your life telling? Lord bless. Amen. Do we have a song, Brother Lee? Miss Crystal? Okay. Just play us in a verse.